right, so welcome to Friday, end of week 15. Again, we have our last lab due, your voice thread is due, and your quiz is due by Sunday. We will meet one more time for live lecture on Monday. My goal will be to go over the quiz with you. That quiz is worth 25 points. So it's a big chunk of points to um, have open book, open note, you know, to make basically go through one more time. Make sure we are aware and ready uh, for the test. And then the test coming up will be closed book, closed notes with the monitoring system. The lab will be closed book, closed notes with the monitoring system. And the, um, the final exam is, again, a comprehensive final. It will be um, just 50 points, and it is going to be a test you take. It looks like you get a zero. Do not panic. I am going to manually count the number of questions you get right. Divide that by the total number of questions, and I'm going to give you a percentage. In a separate column, based on the percentage you achieve, you will achieve a certain point value. So your goal is to try to get 75% or better on this exam or test. Um, and again, the test questions will include endocrine, so you do need to go back and look over your chapter 18. We have gone over a lot of endocrine as we've hit blood pressure regulation, um, digestive tract, and uh, urinary. So you just might want to revisit a little bit of chapter 18 one more time, the very beginning of it, to make sure you remember the types of hormones, how hormones have receptors, and just little details like that. Okay, this chapter actually has helped us review a little bit of that hormone stuff of the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the target, negative feedback, how the hypothalamus gives us releasing factors, the pituitary gland gives us tropic hormones, and they're called tropic hormones because collectively they tell something to grow. So TSH, LH, FSH, ACTH, growth hormone, prolactin, all of those when they're released, not only do they tell the target to maybe release something, but they're also usually telling the target to grow. That's why, again, if you end up with excessive FSH, your testes might enlarge a bit because the sperm number that you're making might have to increase, and that might make those tubes have to enlarge. And then if you're um, increasing your FSH, which they do with IVF protocols, they are going to make the ovaries go from almond shape to like lemon shape because they're going to be pushing multiple follicles to reach tertiary level, all right? And by reaching that tertiary level, again, we're kind of negating inhibins' ability to negative feedback because we keep shooting FSH in with a shot. And that's going to help us, again, potentially when we harvest eggs, get maybe 10, 15 total. And then that way when we fertilize them, and there will be attrition. Um, and in an IVF protocol, the goal might be to get 10 to 15, all right, so five to uh, seven from each ovary, you fertilize them, and right away, maybe two to five won't fertilize. So then you went from 15 total eggs to maybe 10 fertilized, and then by day two or three, which is when they start looking to maybe do a, an, um, a return to the uterus, all right, it might be that those 10 that were fertilized were down now to six. And so of those six at day three, which are maybe, and again, there's a formula, an algorithm, it might be that we look at what are the best two to pick to try to insert. If they wait till day four, because I think the protocols now are even going to day four or day five before they implant, every day that the, the embryos are in the Petri dish, there's going to be attrition. So it might be if there's a day four transfer instead of a day three, what started out as 10 fertilized embryos are now only five or four embryos, and they pick the best two, and they put them in, and the other two, they wait another day or maybe day six, and then they freeze them, okay? Um, and then that way they have frozen embryos to try to, if that two fresh ones they put in, neither one takes, they can try another uh, cycle of fertilizations already done, so just prepping the uterus and try to, again to implant, okay? So again, FSH would make the ovaries grow, um, and most of those hormones coming from your, again, pituitary gland are known as tropic hormones, okay? Now, 
Remember FSH and LH, they are targets in the mail or the testes, the different cells. LH is going to drive our uh, testosterone production, testosterone. And then on the female side, as the follicles develop, the uh, fecal cells, the granulosa cells, they're going to be producing our estrogens. And later on, when they turn into corpus luteal cells, our progesterone. Remember, all of those hormones come from cholesterol. And cholesterol is not water loving, so you have to have a binding protein. So that's one of the reasons why when people uh, get tested, so let's say you're all elite athletes, and today I show up and I say, all right, I need pee and I need blood from you because we're going to do drug testing. All right, I'm testing, of course, for EPO, and I'm testing your red blood cell count, and I'm looking for testosterone levels, okay? And I'm looking for free testosterone, and then I'm looking for the binding protein of testosterone. Matthew, please stop making a mess. Matthew, stop. 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 Walk away. Stop. Don't make me get up. Walk away. Stop making a mess. Sorry. All right. I lost my train of thought. Testosterone. Okay, drug testing. Okay. So they take the testosterone and they look at how much is free. Because remember, because it's a steroid, only a little bit is going to be actually separating from its binding protein and trying to get into the cells, find their receptors. All right. They look at the number of binding protein numbers. And so when they're looking for people who are doping, they're looking at is the free testosterone elevated because they injected it in? Is the binding protein potentially uh, lower than what, again, the number of free testosterone is? Because that could also indicate when they're trying to be tricky, the amount of testosterone doping that's occurring because the binding protein versus the free, there's a certain ratio that they're supposed to be. And it was through the ratio that they taught, they caught the guy Floyd Landis. Um, he was the cyclist, I think, that followed Lance and he won the Tour de France and they caught him for his testosterone doping and again why do people take testosterone Olympic athletes like cyclists I don't think they want to be bulky because to go up the mountain that's not going to help them with more weight but they take testosterone because remember testosterone helps the proteins um, and your metabolism of protein in your muscles cycle and, and it helps you recover Okay, so testosterone and androgens can be used in a cyclic manner, I think, to help build up like bodybuilders, but in day-to-day -day events, they can be abused to help people with growth hormone, again, to uh, help them recover so the next day they can turn around and potentially perform better, especially on something like the Tour de France, where it's 21 days of racing and there's two rest days built into that. And some days the races are 100 miles, some days the races are 60 miles, some days the races are all hills and mountains with huge climbs, some days they're flats and sprints. All right, so we digress. Okay, uh, so the uterine cycle. So remember that the ovaries are FSH, and so FSH is kind of pushing our follicles and inhibin is feedbacking, all right? to negatively keep the FSH from pushing too many follicles, especially towards the kind of like day five, day six, day seven, day eight, when we're getting close to probably one of those follicles becoming secondary and tertiary. So we don't want to have FSH starting new follicles because that is like starting a race with new people when the other runners are halfway into the marathon, okay? These new runners are not going to catch people halfway already to the finish line. So we want to save those again follicles for a later date so that inhibin is important especially in that mid part of that early follicular cycle to prevent too many follicles from being pushed to start to awaken and um, activate so we can save them for later okay and as the follicles develop remember that estrogens estradiol estrogen estradiene estro hydroestrogen you know, all those forms they are going to be heading to the uterus. They are going to be heading in the bloodstream. They are going to be heading to your bone. They are going to be heading to your brain. They're going to be heading to your breast. They're going to be heading to your everywhere. And they are going to be driving, again, like testosterone, growth. Okay? 
estrogen is primarily going to push that endometrial layer, the layer that can grow and shrink, all right, so the innermost mucosal layer, it's going to push that layer around day three, day four, day five, all right, to start to grow. Okay, so in many ways, estrogen and testosterone are both growth kind of pushing hormones. They're steroid hormones. They push growth, but they're doing it in a slower manner than growth hormone would maybe make it work. Okay, now when your estrogen levels somewhere around this day 12, this day 13, again, there's this kind of line, all right, when the estrogen levels cross that line, and they go from being moderate amounts of estrogen and low amounts of estrogen to a nice threshold amount of estrogen, LH goes from being negatively inhibited to now being positively pushed. So the higher amounts of estrogen are now going to end up in your anterior pituitary, and because they're now above threshold, at and above threshold, they're going to start telling those cells more LH, more LH more LH, more LH. And so that is going to lead to this LH surge right around day 12, day 13, day 14, and that is going to be ovulation. Okay? Now, after ovulation happens and all that high estrogen and LH levels, the cells that remain in the follicle because the ovum has left and it's going through meiosis one and it's getting ready hopefully to be fertilized in the ampulla and then it'll hit meiosis two and become an embryo. Those cells that are left are going to convert and they are usually shown very rich in fat and yellowish in color and they are going to then start to make the progesterones, right? Progesterone, progesterone, progesterdiol. Okay, and the progesterone is going to go to what the uterus is now displaying, displaying in that endometrium, and it's going to thicken it up, and it's going to try to make it very, very slimy, very sticky. Okay, so it's not pushing growth per se, but it's pushing slime. And progesterone is going to, again, if this is my anterior pituitary, and here's FSH and my LH, my progesterone is going to negatively feed back both of those hormones, and it's going to go to my hypothalamus where my GNRH is happening, and it's going to negatively inhibit its production. Okay? Now, when these corpus luteal cells develop, they are on a 14-day window for programmed cell death. So they will produce progesterone until around the time either they start to die and then as a hundred of these cells die on day 25 and another hundred die on day 26 and another 150, 200 die on day 27, your progesterone levels start to decline and as the progesterone levels decline, they no longer maintain this uterine situation and the uterine lining will start to slough off and so that's when we start to then see meninces occur and we start physically because it's something we can physically see that's when we reset our time clocks and we say okay we're going to start a new cycle all right if these cells remain alive and the only reason they would remain alive is because the embryo implants in this uterus lining around uh, somewhere around maybe if it ovulated at day 14, fertilized by day 15, it took four more days to get to the uterus, so day 19 it implants, all right? HCG is going to start being produced by that embryo, so from day 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 onward, HCG is going to try to tell the corpus luteum to remain active and remain with progesterone levels. And then progesterone levels at day 27, 28, 29 will actually maintain and continue to uh, hold the uterine lining and you will not get a period and you will then see that if you pee on a stick somewhere around two, three days after that cycle, there now should be hopefully enough HCG being produced by the embryo getting into the woman's bloodstream that some of it is being, again, lost in the urine sample and you would then know that pregnancy is and has happened, okay? Now, one of uh, the, again, 
when we were back in the I had dark ages and we didn't have ultrasound to look and see the ovary and look and see the uterus lining and to predict it because we could see the imaging of it and we didn't have blood tests and we didn't have P tests to be able to see the hormone levels. The only way to tell a woman's cycle was when she bled. So that information of bleeding starts physically, we see it we reset the clock and we start a new cycle kind of holds even though the bleeding in some ways is the ending of the last cycle representing that the endometrium that was grown and slickened up is now being sloughed off and we're getting ready to grow and get a new cycle un underway okay all right um, one of the things about menenses is it should last again depending on age and depending on things anywhere from one to seven days um, usually when girls are younger they have a lot more follicles and they produce a lot more estrogen and that uterine lining grows a lot more they may bleed a little bit more and so their bleeding might be heavier for longer uh, so some of you are in that age bracket that, that's probably your uh, problem when it does uh, happen and then when you get to be more my age where the follicles you have or the straggler left behind and you you push to get probably 10 to you know tops get going every month um, you're probably then seeing that your cycle when you do bleed is maybe one to three days it's not as robust anymore because again your estrogen levels are not as robust because the follicles are not as numerous and as readily available to be pushed into um, awakening okay we do call the first time that someone has their period menarche and again it can happen um, really early because of you may read about it one day if you get into the environmental thing, especially when you start having kids about plastics and about how there's a lot of exogenous estrogens um, in certain chemicals and products. And when we drink and get like milk in these plastics or bottles, uh, we take in excess estrogens outside of what's being made. And it could be potentially pushing girls to have a younger onset of uh, menarche. Um, the other big item is cows to increase their dairy milk. They're giving more. Uh, they're given more estrogens and progesterones to produce higher milky yields, uh, and that milk then, you know, does have that higher estrogen and progesterone potentially filtering into it. And if we then drink that cow's milk, we are increasing again our estrogens being coming in from excess areas. So again, um, all of that leads to. Uh, menarche can happen earlier and it's not uncommon potentially for girls every now and then to potentially show up with periods at 9 and 10 years old. Um, some people again uh, genetically speaking and for maybe because of gymnastics because of the extreme training because of the body fat percentage they do see onset of menarche later okay uh, and so Again, you know, every it becomes a thing if you're ever going to, I guess, teach or deal with puberty children um, that you might see kids 9, 10, 11 starting to come in and get the talk about periods and how to maintain the hygiene associated with that. Uh, and then it might be that you start, if you're in the pediatric world, you might start seeing 14, 15 year old girls coming in like, what's going on why all my friends have this and boobs and bodies developed and I'm still nothing um, so just be aware of that then if you're on the other side and you start working for the OB and the guy side uh, you're gonna see again when does it come back and the, the the territory of when does it go away okay again menopause it's somewhat genetically determined uh, it can happen again early in some cases uh, families it might be that they all kind of go through menopause in the early 40s and then it could be later on in other families uh, we as a culture take a lot of birth control so um, it might be that people take birth control and the birth control has a little bit of estrogen so it pushes the endometrium to grow and then the week they do the dummy pills that little bit of estrogen from week one and week two's pills grew a little bit of endometrium so during the dummy week they slough that off and if they go off the pill at maybe 50 52 55 then they realize oh I really haven't had 
cycles for a while now, but I don't know when exactly that stopped. Um, but some people do remain on the hormones, um, the pill, for into about 50 years old or somewhere in there. Again, that's a discussion you might learn more about when the ob guide comes into play. Um, when to stop birth control pills and when to, you know, let nature take its course. Um, there's a lot of research that was done, and I think it led to some really crazy mixed results about women's hormone therapy. One of the things we know about estrogen is it's protective against heart disease. It's protective against um, uh, osteoporosis. And so the onset of menopause starts to see a decline in women with their bone density, and it's more pronounced loss of bone density than what we see in men. And we see that women, their risk of giving and having a heart attack and stroke all of a sudden goes up and joins what the men's risk has been is at that age, whereas earlier women were protected from having heart attacks and heart related issues for with the estrogen levels. So there was some research that was done and looked at of uh, if we give women hormone therapy of uh, replacement of a little bit of estrogen. Um, could we rescue their bone? Could we rescue and return that loss of um, you know, that, that heart, heart protection. Uh, and the data showed when they gave the hormone therapy to women who had been in menopause and postmenopausal for like 15, 20 years, it actually made things worse. So nowadays, I don't think they give anyone hormone therapy, but Who's to say if they had better controlled when the onset of menopause is and when they start hormone therapy, maybe there could have been better protection for five to ten years right from menopause on. I mean, who's to say? Bad design, but the data showed because, again, a lot of the data was in women long time out of menopause hormone therapy made them more likely to have a stroke and heart attack and more issues came up that maybe hormone therapy isn't a treatment we should, you know, pursue right now. Okay. Um, so that's more about this. All right. So we kind of hit the vagina yesterday. We kind of hit some of the external genitalia in the video. Again, uh, your pelvic floor is going to, um, be something that you, as skeletal muscles, you have to work. So every now and then you'll hear about doing Kegels, um, and then you'll hear about, again, uh, women that do not maintain their pelvic floor. Um, they have issues later in life where they have to start wearing um, depends because they can't control when and if their bladder is going to release. Um, there are, again, vaginal rejuvenation surgeries. There are different, uh, and again, the gynecology side. So if you end up being a nurse in the gynecology world, you will get more into learning how to help women who have potentially problems with their uh, vagina, problems with their urethra and the muscles of the pelvic floor, how to try to help them fix that. Um, the other thing about the pelvic floor here that I want to just mention is the bulb of vestibule. They show that here, and then they show the little tiny yellow as the greater vestibular gland. Again, those were some of the landmarks and glands I asked or um, pointed out yesterday in the um, in the lab. In one of our models, it showed it on the side. Okay, uh, and again, that goes back to those bulbs and those tissues are remnants from in the males, some of the uh, erectile tissue and some of the barbilurethral glands. Okay, um, for the prostate, again, in males, you hear about when you get your prostate checked. One thing we didn't talk about is that you bend over, the guy sticks his hands in your butt, and he pushes forward and palpitates the prostate. So remember, in males, the prostate is going to sit on around the urethra, under the bladder, and right behind it is the um, is the rectum. So part of the way to palpitate it is to go through the rectum and feel and assess if the prostate is growing in size and if it's um, got any weird pieces and parts and if it's not circular in nature. Okay. All right. So. 
that was the other thing I wanted to mention. All right, um, we kind of went through most of this in lab and the nipple mammillary glands. I think I did this right yesterday. The lobules are the little balls, okay? Uh, lobes would be kind of like a pizza slice, this whole leaf area. The lactiferous ducts are, again, the, um, the tubing that's connecting from the lobules and coming towards the ampulla, and then your, um, your lactiferous sinus here instead of an ampulla, the enlargements, and then with, uh, again, oxytocin and squeezing and, and, and then manual pressure and or sucking from the babe, that will then pull the milk out, okay? Um, we've hit these hormones, I hope, uh, sufficiently enough to help you. And again, we've hit the hormones, both the male and the female side, to help you understand how you get estrogen, how you get progesterone, how you get testosterone. In the female, there are some testosterones made. You can see the fecal cells make cholesterol to androgen. The androgens become converted to uh, estrogen. Some of these androgens could potentially be leaking slightly out of the follicle, but most of the androgens that are in the female are coming from the adrenal gland. Okay, so mostly what the follicle is making is the cholesterol. The end result is it's estrogen or progesterone depending on the cycle. The androgens that are made are going to become adrenal. And so when a woman stops having the estrogen and progesterone production from her follicles, from menopause, sometimes we see the only testosterone, the only steroid hormones that are still somewhat being made and circulated are now only coming from the adrenal gland. And the adrenal gland making androgens are now beginning to cause the women's like hair, lip to become more like again, masculinized, so they start to have more hair growing out of their lip. They start to maybe see the drop of their Adam's apple. That's why you don't usually see old ladies that are still sopranos and their voice changes a little bit. You know, so that, that masculinization starts to occur. Unfortunately, it's not enough to cause the red blood cells to go up and then to turn into bodybuilders. You know, we can still hope for that. Um, all right, so... I think I've hit this five functions of estrogen. Again, they are going to do basically similar to the testosterone. They're going to affect multiple tissues, multiple locations. The end result is they are trying to grow the endometrium, prepare the body for being sexually active and sexually aroused. They get mucus going in the vagina, and that preps up the vagina to be potentially more excited for intercourse to occur. So again, an issue with postmenopausal women is the testosterone from the adrenal gland makes their sex drive go up. Lack of estrogen from the follicles makes their vagina dry out. So they want to have sex, but they have dry vaginas. And sex might be more difficult or um, not as comfortable without that mucus and without that secretions. So there has to be external lube that comes into play. Okay. All right. And the last thing we want to talk about is how to get pregnant or how to not get pregnant. So many of your hormone-based pregnancy prevention contraceptions are going to have predominantly progesterone. Okay. And back in the day, I remember uh, pregnazone, um, the shot. And then there was something where you put like the little patch. And most of those types of hormone contra uh, their contraception was progesterone being slowly released. And because it was only progesterone, your period would go away. So while you were taking the, the shot, you wouldn't have your period for four months. Or while you had the patch for that period, the patch would release, slowly release the progesterone. There would be no period. And the reason why the progesterone worked that way is, remember, estrogen is what grows the uterus, okay? So if you are giving yourself shots of progesterone, none of this growth happens, and the progesterone then has no nothing really to push to thicken up. And then the progesterone feeds back and inhibits, remember, the FSH and the LH. So 
as long as the FSH and the LH stay inhibited, you don't get a follicle pushing, you don't get an ovulation occurring, and then in the uterus, there's no endometrial lining increasing. So if something typically was to happen, God forbid, that an FSH snuck through and enough follicles developed that you did ovulate and did get an egg, the chances are the uterine lining with that progesterone level would not have grown, so it wouldn't have a very good chance of implanting. All right. Now, what we found is when we give people those contraceptions of progesterone only, we miss out on the protective effects of estrogen. So I have many, many friends that were huge fans in their 20s of taking the shot, taking the patch. And when we got to be in our 30s, they started to say, no, you have to get off of it because you are not getting your estrogen levels for pushing bone development and utilizing this young age of building bone density without that estrogen being there. So now most contraceptives that you take orally or patches or vaginal rings or even uh, other forms, all right, suppositories or whatever, they are going to be a cycle of a little bit of estrogen, usually a little bit of estrogen, like I said, to build up the, the uterine lining, maybe just a small amount, all right, and then more progesterone, again, just a little bit of progesterone to, again, kind of uh, keep the inhibition, inhibiting of FSH and LH. So the first week or two of the cycle will be a little estrogen, a little progesterone, keep the FSH down, keep the LH down, but grow a little bit of the endometrium so the estrogen can, again, be in the blood supply enough to push the secondary characteristics, to push the bone development, but the progesterone is the main player in inhibiting follicle development and inhibiting the uterine um, from getting too nice and, and compatible for implantation. All right. Okay. So those are ways to try to prevent females from, again, having an, an egg develop, having it ovulate, having a uterus that's hospitable. An easier way, of course, is you just let your cycle happen and you use any kind of contraception that prevents sperm from entry Entry, entry going inside the uterus through the cervix. So that's why there's female condoms, there's the sponge, if you ever go back and watch Seinfeld, there's diaphragms. Um, one of those things about many of those things is they're limited in their use um, and or they can, if your body changes size, then you need to be refitted for them, um, like the diaphragm. And again, you hear about or back in movies or something like the diaphragm, she might punch holes in it. So she has the diaphragm, but it actually has holes in it. So sperm could still get through the punctures. Same thing with the condom. That's the risk you take is hoping that the condom doesn't rip, tear, or stretch, and the integrity of it is um, intact so sperm wouldn't get through. Okay, so those are barrier type methods to prevent pregnancy. The goal being, if I don't let sperm get into the uterus, I don't then have sperm potentially with oxytocin and prostaglandin and the contractions of the of the myometrium being thrown up like in a trampoline towards the uterine tubes, and then the cilia cells are not helping sperm make it to the um, to the embryo or to the egg. Okay. Uh, good Catholics, good people who follow uh, religious practices for birth control, they try to watch the cycle by when you ovulate, there is usually a temperature spike. Um, they usually have to count their cycle uh, so they know what days to try to have pre uh, sex or avoid sex. Um, and again, now you can even buy the little LH sticks and you can try to better predict by peeing on the LH stick uh, when you're going to ovulate and try to avoid intercourse. The ovum is only going to probably survive in the uterine tube for about 24 hours. Sperm, they say, can live in the uterus uh, and the uterine tubes anywhere for about two to as maybe long as seven days. So again, if you're a good Catholic family and we pick on Catholic Catholics, and I'm Catholic, so I can pick on them. Um, you sometimes see Catholic families have a lot of children, and it's because they, you know, there's a big uh, doctrine of we don't do external prevention, we don't take external, extreme external measures to try to prevent conception. 
And so um, their main use of birth control that's approved is the rhythm method, knowing your cycle, watching your temperature, and trying to, if you don't want a kid, avoid having sex when the odds of it happening are highly probable. So you're playing the statistics game. Um, for males, uh, again, barrier methods are the easiest and effective. I think they say now that condoms are like 99% effective. Uh, so barriers, there's also things that you can do like spermicides. Um, so when you ejaculate in, put the spermicide or the gels or creams that try to kill the sperm, that's less effective because some of the sperm in that time could still get into the uterus and get into the uterine tubes and head their way towards the egg. Um, more extreme methods would be, again, to vasectomy, cut the epididymic connection to the vas deferens so the sperm exiting could potentially miss the tube. Now, depending upon that cut, if it's not that far away and you can still jump the distance, some of the sperm might still get through. So it's not, it's not a... It's not always 100%, um, but most of the time that cut is significant enough. The tubes separate enough that any sperm are then going to end up in that interstitial extracellular area, and then our immune system and our cells would remove it and program cell death would occur. Um, other ways, we could give guys some type of inhibin or we could give them some type of in, uh, blockage to their FSH production and reduce their sperm counts. Um, most of the time, guys, the easier and most simple way to prevent pregnancy and yet can maintain your ability to still have children at your choosing is to just use a barrier method, okay? If I want to enhance uh, for older guys, you hear about, you know, getting testosterone creams, getting um, FSH injections. FSH is a very expensive hormone, um, so it's probably easier to get some of those testosterone creams because testosterone with FSH levels would stimulate spermatogonia production. Um, for guys, for the most part, you need one you produce millions, so uh, unless you're shooting zero sperm, as long as you have some sperm, then it just becomes about timing. And increasing the odds of pregnancy really comes down to knowing when the egg is going to be out there available to be fertilized. And so monitoring the woman's cycle you watch the temperature, you watch for the LH surge, and again, so much LH ends up in the bloodstream that it pees into the urine, and it would make the little LH pee stick light up um, and mark that LH is highly apparent, so ovulation is going to occur. If you go into the doctor's office, uh, they can ultrasound and find when the tertiary follicle is about ready to burst. They can give a shot of a LH kind of in um, agonist that will cause ovulation to happen within that 12 to 24 hour window and they can say all right go home and have lots of sex now or if again the male has a very low sperm motility and sperm count they can say all right we're going to give you the shot tomorrow you come in your partner gives us the sample we harvest the sample we put the viable sperm that we can collect in a little a syringe, we inje inject that syringe into your uterus, and um, it's not that painful because uh, it's just a little tube to get through the uterus, and we then spit that sperm into the uterus and let nature take its course. Again, if nature doesn't take its course, then you go into more invasive things of pulling the eggs out, pull the sperm from the male, put them together in the Petri dish, and then take the embryo, put it back in, and hope it takes. If it doesn't take, and I've had some friends that they've done cycle after cycle of IVF, and they're still, they get embryos in the Petri dish, but they're not planting in the woman, then you start looking for a surrogate. Um, and find a younger womb to try to put that embryo where maybe it will be more likely to implant. There is a lot of risk, and a woman is giving up potentially nine months of her life to carry that baby to term. But I guess if you get to say you carried Kim Kardashian's and the West guy, was it them that they had like their third kid, I think, by surrogate? Um, and I guess they pay very well. Maybe it's worth giving your womb up. I'm too old for that, so don't. Don't think about that. I did have one friend in graduate school 
she uh, had no desire to have children, but she did um, go through her uh, IVF cycles and would donate her eggs. Um, and she got paid a pretty decent amount for that. Other ways, if you're looking for money to pay for eventual med school or dental school, uh, I hear poop donations to get your fecal matter or another way to make some money. Um, so that is some of the ideas. If I was to ask you this question on the test, I would want you to explain in about five to six sentences with correct anatomical terminology how to increase or decrease pregnancy. All right. The easiest way would be to say uh, a female condom is placed in the vagina to block the entrance into the cervix of the external os. So any sperm ejaculated into the vagina is unable to move into the uterus and into the uterine tubes towards the uh, towards the oocyte that is hopefully there uh, preventing pregnancy and you could say the same thing about the male condom and in that little statement I use lots and lots of anatomically correct terms and that would show me you understand how this works most of you are probably at the age it's all about preventing pregnancy right now and that's perfectly fine when and if you're ready to then make pregnancy happen uh, then you can revisit this chapter and look at that material again all right so I'm gonna stop the recording